Welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atto Kwesen, and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. In this episode, we will be looking at the concept of interdisciplinarity and the various ways in which it is defined across the humanities, the social sciences, and STEM subjects. Interdisciplinarity has gained prominence as a buzzword in intellectual circles, at least since the 1990s. Entire institutional programs are set up with the explicit purpose of pursuing interdisciplinary studies. And yet, the conceptual character and methodological implications of interdisciplinarity are not always easy to determine. We will note what we do when we say we are doing interdisciplinarity, the range of subjects of research and teaching, and the kinds of institutional structures that sustain interdisciplinary research. But most importantly, we will also examine the contradictions and difficulties that emerge when we pursue interdisciplinary work, especially with respect to the translation of concepts and methods from one discipline into another. There is no scholar I can think of nowadays that has an aversion toward interdisciplinary studies. Interdisciplinary programs vary widely in emphasis and include feminist, gender, and sexuality studies, African and African-American studies, history and philosophy of science, biomedical informatics, comparative studies in race and ethnicity, diaspora and transnational studies, and urban studies, among various others. At Stanford, they also have several interdisciplinary centers, schools, and institutes, such as the Taub Center for Jewish Studies, the Alzheimer's Research Center, the Beckman Center for Molecular and Genetic Medicine, and the Woods Institute for the Environment, all of which cross boundaries and provide physical and intellectual intersections between disciplines for incubating new ideas and innovative research across the humanities and social sciences, and indeed the sciences. At Stanford and other universities, it has been recognized that the large-scale questions raised by environmental degradation, increasingly complex cities, water shortage and its management, public health crises, migration and refugees, and the vagaries of globalization cannot be addressed via simple models, and that to prepare ourselves and our students for the challenges that lie ahead, they and we have to be equipped with nimble ways of thinking beyond single disciplinary perspectives. The proverb that Ezewulu shares with his son in Chinua Achebe's Arrow of God seems entirely appropriate as a justification for interdisciplinarity. The earth, says Ezewulu, is like a mask dancing. You cannot see it properly by standing still. It appears, however, that the place of humanistic enquiry 
in these new configurations of interdisciplinarity is less than assured. This is partly because of long ingrained doubts about the practical value of work done in the humanities and the serious questions often raised about their winning role in the job market. After all, how does studying metaphors in Milton compare to designing new traffic lights that might help ease traffic congestion in our major towns and cities? Posed in this way, the contribution of the humanities and the interpretative social sciences seems somewhat modest, if not embarrassingly redundant. However, rather than launch a defense of the humanities from the perspective of what they contribute to the expansion of our sensibility as human beings, what I want to do today is to rethink the entire enterprise of interdisciplinarity from a reformulated perspective. I would like to suggest that the division in some quarters, and even, alas, here at Stanford, between what is described as basic research on the one hand and policy or world impacting research on the other, in which the humanities and the social sciences and the STEM subjects are respectively siloed, is entirely defective and indeed deleterious to forming new forms of knowledge that would be properly responsive to the challenges of the world we are confronted with today. No one has ever read Immanuel Kant's observations on the feeling of the beautiful and the sublime and asked what policy implications it might have. And yet, it can amply be shown that Kant's ideas have had a major impact not only in philosophy, but also in literary studies, anthropology, politics, environmental studies, and even in architecture. It is not unusual for responses to natural disasters, such as hurricanes and earthquakes in many parts of the world, to be couched in terms of Kant's sublime. The same can be said for the work of some of the most influential humanists and social scientists we have known both past and present, such as Eric Averbach, Edward Said, Clifford Geertz, Martha Nussbaum, Hayden White, Henri Lefebvre, and Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht, to name just a few that I myself have found highly fertile to my own thinking as an interdisciplinary literary critic. In its wide usage, the term interdisciplinary proliferates a number of confusions which turn on the issue of what exactly such work in the humanities and the social sciences and indeed in the sciences really entails. We might draw on Julie Thompson Klein's landmark book interdisciplinarity, history, theory, and practice to get a working sense of the different forms of inter interdisciplinarity we find in universities and research institutes. Interdisciplinarity designates a whole range of activities. The first sense of interdisciplinarity is what is set up to engage in collaborative problem solving. For example, when a healthcare team of university researchers, clinicians, 
corporate officials, agency staff, and citizens come together to tackle a particular public health issue, such as COVID, for example. Schools of public health and institutes that focus on international security offer examples of such interdisciplinary collaborative problem solving. Such units lean toward both intervention and policy orientations. And while neither seems to have any particular interest in the interpretative humanities, the point is that they are both interdisciplinary also in the sense of generating predictive interpretative models of the problems they are trying to solve. We shall return to the idea of predictive modeling later in our discussion. The second sense of interdisciplinarity has to do with efforts at bridge building between disciplines that nevertheless remain firmly discrete in their methodologies. When C.P. Snow raised the question of the regrettable separation between the humanities and the hard sciences in his Breed Lecture of 1959, his contention was that the British education system had overly rewarded the humanities over the sciences, especially in the study of Latin and Greek, and that people at the time seemed to be educated exclusively either in the humanities or the sciences, but never in both. This view was in its turn questioned by the literary critic F.R. Leavis and the two cultures debate that degenerated between them spawned a whole series of attempts at bringing the two areas of inquiry together. In our own day, the educational systems in several countries attempt to resolve the crisis of the two cultures by requiring that students take courses in a range of courses in the humanities, the social sciences, and the hard sciences as prerequisites for graduation in all fields of interest. Diverse competencies such as quantitative reasoning, which is not the same as mathematics, and interpretative reasoning, which is not the same as literary criticism, are actively encouraged for students to graduate. The different degree structures of universities in the UK and the US pursue depth and breadth quite differently. In schools such as Cambridge and Oxford, you are admitted to study a single subject, such as say English or history or the natural sciences, and are then given a deep immersion for three years in that disciplinary subject area. Even though it is not entirely guaranteed, it is not unknown for that deep immersion in a single subject to generate a transformative interest in completely different disciplinary areas. As in when an archaeology student begins to take an interest in the history of fashion from studying the ruins of different cultures and epochs. Or a musicology student begins to develop keen perception of the city as the producer of different soundscapes. Contrastingly, the dominant model in the US is a modular system where students are encouraged to sample 
as wide a range of disciplinary offerings as possible before declaring their majors and minors at the end of the second year. The declaration of majors and minors still allows for students to combine various disciplines in pursuit of their degree. Whether such prerequisites and structures lead to interdisciplinary thinking early on from the undergraduate degree is not easy to determine and at least would likely not have satisfied the likes of C.P. Snow. But the point is that there are different routes to becoming an interdisciplinary scholar. Sometimes the deep immersion in a single discipline may tip you over into another discipline entirely, as with the UK examples, while at other times, it is the brushing together of concepts from completely different disciplinary domains that sparks the abiding interest. Different scholars have tried to bridge the gap between the cultures of humanistic interpretation and scientific inquiry with books that actively translate the idioms of the sciences into that of the interpretative humanities and vice versa. This can be seen, for example, in the work of the literary critic and philosopher Christopher Norris in his book, Quantum Theory and the Flight from Realism, which provides an astute reading of quantum physics via deconstruction. This is quite different from Karen Barad's Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning, which, for her part, encompasses feminist theory, physics, and 20th century continental philosophy among other uh, areas. And Norris and Barad's books are in their turn also different from Gillian Beer's Darwin's Plots, Evolutionary Narrative in Darwin, George Eliot, and the 19th century novel, uh, where the objective is to read from Charles Darwin's theory of evolution for interpreting the 19th century English novel, as the title obviously suggests. The third definition of interdisciplinarity turns on the melding together of overlapping areas of separate disciplines for the creation of entirely new fields of inquiry. Fields such as psycholinguistics, criminology, Egyptology, urban studies, the history of science, and the medical humanities all fall under the rubric of interdisciplinarity. Scholars working in these fields are typically conversant with the methods of at least two different disciplines and attempt to move readily to integrate insights from more than one discipline in their work. This does not mean that there are no problems with the integration of insights. In the field of medical humanities, for example, there is a vast difference in how literary scholars might read, say, Sophocles' Philoctetes from how physicians might consider the same play. As we might recall from our earlier episode of critic reading writing on Philoctetes, the titular character 
has been abandoned on the island of Lemnos by the Greek army for almost a decade before the play opens. The focus of the action of the play is as much on Philoctetes' disability from a bad pus-filled sore on his foot from being bitten by a snake before his exile, as it is on the evolving conscience of Neoptolemus, Achilles' son, who is set up by Odysseus to trick Philoctetes of the magic bow and arrows of Heracles. It had been prophesied that Heracles' bow was required for the Greeks to win the Trojan War. Scholars of the classics read the play as a problem play about the relationship between disability, moral residue, compassion, and ethics. While physicians might typically worry about the recalcitrance and essential untreatability of the central protagonist's excruciating pain that is depicted in the play. For, as Eric J. Cassell tells us in The Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Medicine, the failure to relieve a patient's pain is a key source of epistemological crisis for any physician and a source of much anguish for them. Since Philoctetes is a fictional character and not a real human being with no treatable medical symptoms, however, what physicians gain from reading the play is the sensibility to certain humanistic ethical perspectives, but not really any insights into how to treat their patients that they would not have gained directly from clinical practice. The point, however, is that the melding of disciplines into fields such as the medical humanities also requires the cultivation of skills and interpretative protocols from completely different disciplines. We shall cycle back to the question of interpretative protocols later on in our discussion. A fourth type of interdisciplinarity comes from the development of synthetic meta-theories that are applied across disciplines and that then come to give them a family resemblance of concepts and interpretative methods. Marxism, structuralism, postmodernism, and game theory offer such meta-theoretical templates for interdisciplinary application. Also, certain key thinkers such as Hegel, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Michel Foucault, and Mikhail Bakhtin, among others, have provided a reservoir of concepts that run across different disciplines from literature and anthropology to economics. These thinkers may be considered as large-scale synthesists and systems theorists, and the ambition of their followers is really to build interpretative frameworks that comprehensively explain everything or almost everything. The very first category on the list that we have just seen may be designated as instrumental interdisciplinarity, while all the others can be taken as illustrating different species of synoptic interdisciplinarity. Instrumental interdisciplinarity is generally aimed at forms of direct intervention in the world outside of the interdisciplinary collaboration, while synoptic interdisciplinarity tends to be geared more toward the collocation 
and assemblage of concepts, methods, and procedures for the constitution of areas of inquiry without any clearly interventionist agenda into material reality. For the vast number of scholars in the social sciences and humanities, interdisciplinarity simply means work of the synoptic rather than the instrumental variety. While in the sciences and in policy-oriented fields, it is the instrumental variety that takes precedence. The important thing to note, however, is that both types of interdisciplinarity are ultimately concerned with the modeling and constitution of knowledge that is useful for navigating the world, even when this proceeds from a primary engagement with texts and concepts rather than with specific problems in the world itself. Now, the central weakness of all the definitions of interdisciplinarity we have looked at so far is that they signally ignore the degree to which individual disciplines are internally differentiated according to sometimes contrasting protocols of proposition making and indeed of concepts and methodologies. Thus, in four field departments of anthropology, for example, biological anthropologists often fail to see sociocultural anthropologists as contributing to the discipline at all, while sociocultural anthropologists return the complement in kind. In English literary studies, to be a Shakespearean or medievalist requires that you know something about the historical etymology of words, that you have a reasonable grasp of several European languages, such as Greek, Latin, and French, in addition to English, and that you are familiar with different non-literary fields pertinent to the periods in question, such as medicine, natural history, and even discourses on war and music, just to highlight the most common examples. No Shakespearean or medievalist scholar will achieve any recognition in their field if they are not able to demonstrate all of these skills to an appreciable degree of sophistication. Their work seems to be as close to that of historians as they are to those of literary scholars. A scholar of, say, Virginia Woolf or Chinua Achebe does not have the same burdens of proposition making and it is not uncommon on search or tenure committees for people to talk at cross purposes when evaluating files in fields different from their own. But whether with English and history, history and philosophy, or comparative literature and music, we are still looking at disciplines that share strong family resemblances in terms of their mutual interest in humanistic modes of uh, inquiry and interpretation. The real challenge comes when the interpretative humanities attempt to borrow from the social sciences or even the hard sciences in such cases, the distance from humanistic inquiry may completely distort the procedure for borrowing 
unless an explicit acknowledgement is made about what concepts and methods exactly are being carried over. Even though a work such as Thomas Kuhn's very well known The Structure of Scientific Revolutions has had a major impact on the idea of literary history, what was borrowed from this signal work was not Kuhn's discussion of science, but rather his elaboration of the changing rhythms of scientific problems and the quest for their solution. In other words, it was the history of it that was borrowed by literary scholars. The upshot of what I have been saying thus far is that when we claim to be doing interdisciplinarity, we must specify as clearly as possible what kinds of concepts, methods, and propositional protocols we are carrying over from another discipline and what this does to our configuration of interdisciplinarity. It is no use either in the instrumental or synoptic variants of interdisciplinarity we just looked at to use the term interdisciplinarity without specifying what exact protocols of proposition making are at stake. Thus, to be truly interdisciplinary, one must be able to prove to be conversant with the protocols of proposition making in all the disciplines within the interdisciplinary mix. Someone who claims to be sharing insights on the history of slavery from the perspective of literary studies, for example, ought to be able to demonstrate to both literary scholars and historians that they have mastered the protocols of proposition making in both disciplines and not just in one of them. A historian reading their contribution should be able to get a clear sense of historiography from it, while a literary critic should be able to enter the realm of history from the domain of literary details that are explored in the contribution. The issue of protocols of proposition making raises serious questions about how scholars purporting to be interdisciplinary are trained, which also means a conscious self-awareness of the limits of their own primary disciplinary training and a humility in learning thoroughly and not just as a convenience from the rigorous protocols of other disciplines. Some have argued that to be interdisciplinary, one requires to know a single discipline really well before moving on to another. My own view, however, is that it is not so much a deep awareness of a home discipline that is required, but a good sense that every discipline has its own protocols of proposition making, and that to become interdisciplinary is to learn such protocols in depth and not superficially. I want to suggest that this added rigor would produce a welcome dimension not only to our individual thinking, but it would also help to clarify what values we incorporate into our interdisciplinary research and curricula, and perhaps most importantly, what kinds of institutional structures we require to operationalize our understanding of interdisciplinarity. In our next episode, we'll be looking specifically at the interdisciplinary field of urban studies and its relationship to spatial theory. My own focus next week 
will be on reading urban studies through the perspective of Accra. See you next week. Please remember to check the suggested readings in the episode description. And if you like this episode, remember to give a thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notifications bell so that you do not miss any upcoming episodes and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.